All right, thank you. My name's Sarah Jones, I'm head of the School of Media here at Birmingham City University. And it's quite interesting coming to this, looking at technology and identity and what it all means. And a lot of my work is within virtual reality, where you can literally become someone else and explore how people respond to you in different ways by taking on different identities. Um, but our, our panel is incredible um, and they've got so many really interesting ideas to share with you. So I'm going to introduce them all first straight away. Um, so we have Ellie Clark. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> Sophie Woolley. Zoe Partington. And Adam Carver. So they're all going to... Sorry, I forgot to let you have the applause. Um, <laughs> they're all going to take it away and give a very short presentation, and then they'll, they'll probably just have a big argument um, or a very big discussion. Um, and it would be great, obviously, to get you involved as well. Um, I'm usually living on Twitter, so if there's any questions uh, that come to your mind as they're, they're giving their presentations, do tweet using HC identity hashtag um, or include me for virtual Sarah J and I will pass those questions on if I can get a word in. So the first presentation is Ellie Clark. I'm going to stand up. Hello. <coughs> um, yeah, so I'm doing partly script and I might go off script because it's very late on here. But um, yeah, so um, uh, this is me. This is my Facebook profile picture. And I did an exercise recently with some students that I taught where I got them to all put their pro profile pictures up. And it was really interesting in terms of kind of intimacy, because obviously your profile picture is public, and all the students were highly embarrassed to look at my profile picture. Um, and it, they also felt that it was a bit of an invasion for me to look at theirs. So what I'm really interested in is this kind of relationship between the online traces, someone has said ghost or shadow. I talk about the digital body as being the kind of the identity that is constructed, as been mentioned by several people, by the interactions that we have online with other people or the posts that we do by ourselves on all these different so social media platforms, even your internet um, website, sorry, so whatever it is. So, and clearly, so the development and penetration of smartphones and social media into our intimate and everyday lives over the past two decades has had a massive impact on the way that we perceive, experience, perform and exist in the world, personally, professionally and politically. I'm an artist who makes work about what I perceive to be the changing face, experience, feel and role of the physical object and body in our increasingly digitally mediated world, which I explore through photography, video, um, analog and digital photography, um, performance audio, music, drag, curating, and community projects. And also through Sajina, who is a kind of gender ambiguous, border straddling, multi bodied uh, drag queen who sings songs about love, lust, and loneliness with her mobile phone always in her hand, as most of us always have. Um, and I'm interested really in what this impact of the digital has, again, upon the way that we inhabit space and the way we feel in our bodies, and even to the point where um, our bodies may even be able to be beginning to feel out of date as a technology, as our vessel um, that carries our identity with us. So this is Sajina on the left, a very early rendition of her, 2010. Um, she first arrived in physical format for kind of queer parties in Berlin um, around 2008, 2009, 10. Um, and along with her girlfriends, she was perceived as a cis male underneath um, drag queen, whereby so all three people here with Sajina are all actually cis females, but very, very tall. And um, during Christopher Street Day in Berlin, when we all went out together, we were invited to all the gay men's sex clubs, and all the lots of women said, "Oh, drag queens have much better legs than women do." So, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was very much like the performance dictates perception, and perception very much impacts then on performance. So, when I address the Sajina, uh, there's kind of like almost like a feedback loop. So by becoming more femme, I gain male privilege, which is, has been the whole sort of side aspect of that project, um, which has been very interesting. Um, yeah, so during this time, I was writing actually songs um, and poems about um, kind of our relationship with technology um, and sort of love, lust, and loneliness. 
And I was in a band where I performed these songs originally in this kind of punk band in Berlin, and then the band disbanded, and I realised these songs needed to be taken further. So they needed to be pop songs, but I'm not really a pop star, but Sagina could do it. So she kind of came in to, to, to you know, be the spokeswoman in a way for that. This is a still from the first music video I made. And I have to also say the whole project is completely collaborative. So every song is written with a different musician. Every video is made with different people. And I think for particularly queer culture, it's so collaboration or for all artistic kind of low money culture, collaboration is so key. Um, so it was in a, actually the making of the second music video called I Want to See You from a Different Perspective that I began to think, well, if I can play Sagina, why can't other people also play Sagina? Why, can, why does it just have to be me? Why do I have to be kind of um, possessive over this character? Because actually, you know, already the music's being written by different people, the videos. And so I began to make this music video where three different people during the video, and you can find it on YouTube or whatever, um, actually embody this character. And amazingly, that dress just seemed to fit everybody. I have no idea why that <laughs> happened. I got it in a in vintage shop here in Birmingham, actually, but um, yeah. Um, and then I was sort of, so after that I wrote a manifesto, and I don't know if I'm going to bother reading it all out, because if these slides are available later. Um, but sort of, really, most importantly, the idea of the collective I. So that Sagina is always singular, but she, uh, there are many of her. So Sagina is always I, but can many people, can, many voices can be saying I at the same time, which sort of ties in a little bit with what Hito Stale's saying about, you know, YouTube, how are you doing Ellie, how are you, the kind of, the, it's sort of almost the opposite to what, how m social media works, where it just always points at the one person in the collective. So it's sort of a slightly, I suppose, in resistance to that. Um, so, so the idea, again, plurality, Sagina's stimulatingly sexy, simultaneous simulation of herself was where I then, uh, and this was thanks to actually Karen Newman of BOM, who um, I think over lunch I said, I'd love to do a performance called this. And then four months later she rings me up and says, you can do the performance, and then I had to figure out how to do it. This was 2015, and I, the, I did it over Google Hangout in the end, and I had to find five different people, um, all in places beginning with B, to do this project, and um, we had Brooklyn, um, I, well, I was in South, it was for the Lowry, Berlin, Belgrade, um, where else? Bristol, anyway, five places beginning with me. And we did a series of um, crazy kind of um, neighbor annoying rehearsals at very late at night to, 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 to enable the guy in, Brook, in Brooklyn to join in. And uh, I got very told off by neighbors on sort of Google Hangout trying to work out bad choreography and things. Here we go, this is some of our rehearsals, for instance. So that's Vladimir and Belgrade, and then we've got um, Raul and Eve in the middle um, in Mexico, and, yeah. So, and also, of course, that no one met each other in person for the whole duration, they still haven't. That was also something interesting. And then this idea of the repeated gesture. That just, yeah, so, so repeated and, and copied. Um, but, So it's using this really kind of lo-fi technology. So this is Vladimir in Belgrade in the foreground. That was me actually in Brighton in the background. So it's kind of like it sort of matches, but it also highlights the failure of the technology. And then with the kind of clunky, organic, not perfect, not polished performance, uh, lip syncing of these, this kind of music. Um, 
Yeah, and then, so really, the fact that we can do so much remotely and present so much of ourselves online calls into the question of the necessity of physical presence, and um, as well as the agency of the body, as I was saying, of, as our primary mode of interaction with the world. So Sajina's sort of unquenchable desire to be screened and to be recorded and to be shown online plays this idea that the body itself is no longer enough. It needs to be mirrored, backed up by a digital double. So you have this idea of the repeated gestures. That was another person playing Sajina. And so the idea of the confused identity, at what point does the digital have more presence than the non-digital body on stage? So what wins? And actually what you find is often if, if there's a screen in the room, it will be the screen that people will look at rather than the person, particularly if it's much bigger. And so you have this idea of this. And also what happens when you have very different bodies and subjectivities inhabiting the same identity. So it was obviously we had a kind of code of what people wore and I worked with a designer in Berlin who made this um, jacket for everybody. And then this was from a project in Brighton um, where there's a, a, a poem called Waiting that lots of people came in and they could book themselves in and get dressed up and then do that. So then it was a whole load of people and this was kind of open source Sagina so anyone could come um, and it's going to be at some point I'll get around to editing it. Oops. Yeah, so it's just kind of what happens when you put this, when a wearable, transferable identity, and what could that mean, really? Yeah. Um, I think I'll stop, I won't go through that because I haven't got enough time. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Next level, Ellie. Oh, no, no. thank <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, my name's Sophie Woolley, and I'm making a show called Augmented. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Uh, I'm making a show called Augmented about, um, that's uh, an unlimited commission. It's funded by the Arts Council. And Augmented is about my experience of becoming a deaf cyborg. I don't use the word cyborg as a metaphor. It is my lived, everyday reality. It's what I am. I am a cyborg. <coughs> I hear using a cochlear implant, and I have a computer chip, computer technology, and electrodes embedded inside, my, inside me, inside my skull. And I wear an external processor, which attaches with the help of a, a magnet on either side of my skull. And I used to look at uh, implanted people, before I had an implant, I used to look at implanted people and shudder. It looked a bit yuck. And I just carried on using sign language interpreters and palantypists until I went completely deaf. I have hereditary progressive deafness. And five years ago, I had surgery and my implant was switched on. The show that I'm developing, Augmented, the show is about power. Having grown up hearing and then spent 20 <coughs> years going deaf and now being able to hear well again, I can compare the difference in how powerful I feel. Now, I uh, just want to make it clear that I, I speak for myself today. Deaf people are all different. We all get different results from cochlear implants. Now, I feel that it is a fix. But some people, they don't get the result. The, uh, the title of my show, Augmented, it refers in part to being able to do things that hearing people cannot do. I can Bluetooth music direct to my brain. Mm -hmm. I can manipulate um, the way I receive sound in, in various ways. I have five programs on my processor. I can use ultra zoom setting to focus on one speaker in front of me in a noisy place. I call myself uh, a deaf cyborg because my deafness is, uh, deafness is my default setting when I switch off my cochlear implant. My implant, it renders me a retrofit. I've been retrofitted in order to, to simulate a hearing identity and reality. And despite uh, the fact that I identify now as a deaf cyborg, I usually, I usually pass as a hearing person. 
And sometimes, if I feel tired though, or if I'm on the wrong program setting for an environment, I'm suddenly deaf again, or hard of hearing. I, I, I kind of switch around the identities. Now, I wanted to write my show because there is some stigma and ignorance about implants. And I suspect that some people, and often they're hearing people, I, I suspect that people think that I've dropped <coughs> out. And they give me this look as if to say, have you just sold your soul? And when I get these sort of looks, I realise that I'm clearly from the future now. <laughs> and I will have to write a play. I will have to <laughs> perform a play that shows people how I have been augmented and how I have travelled through time into the future. Um, at the moment, I'm reading an old science fiction story uh, called The Ship Who Sang by Anne McCaffrey. And I'm told that the book inspired the Cyborg Manifesto essay by Donna Haraway. Now, in this book, The Ship Who Sang, Helva, the character, is a human being whose disabled body is encased in titanium and whose brain is conditioned and used to control a spaceship. Helva is a human spaceship, a brain ship. And one of her brawns, her non-augmented captain, disagrees with the policy of turning disabled children into spaceships. And the captain finds it horrific, of course. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like an abomination, doesn't it? At this point, Helva, the brain ship, feels a wave of superiority. Why should she miss being able to move around on Earth when she can spend hundreds of years flying around space instead? Now, I was relieved to find a cyborg character that I could relate to in a novel. I relate to spaceships now, and that feels good. It feels excellent. And this feeling, this feeling is not science fiction. The way I feel is, is science fact. <laughs> Okay, next we have Zoe Partington. Have we got there? Yeah. Not that it matters, actually. Um, that was great, Sophie, thank you. <laughs> I've just... Um, I'm, I'm Zoe, some of you may well know me. Um, and I'm here um, in, a, in a sort of similar but different capacity, I suppose, to Sophie. Um, I'm visually impaired. Um, but I also, um, I have an insulin pump that some other, some other people in here may well have those. Um, and the insulin pump is like, um, mirrors people that don't have diabetes, how you're physiologically, how your body works. Um, so it does lots of things for me. Mine has like really interesting settings and one of them is an alcohol setting, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> um, and when I first met and sat down with the diabetes liaison nurse and went, it's got, a it's got an alcohol setting, it was really exciting because, you know, for years, and I've had diabetes for about 40 years, and I've only been on a pump for five years, it was a very different type of environment for me. Um, and some of those issues within that have meant that I've lost quite a lot of my sight. So I have some sight. Um, so I, I'm interested in visual things. I probably miss a lot of visual things, which in some ways, hearing about identities today, um, might be an advantage, I think, because I don't necessarily um, make relationships or connect with things through visual means. I connect with things through words. And so I thought I'd just very quickly read out... Um, I'm very interested in audio description. I'm very interested in how words build visual pictures or memories and sort of embed that in, in your thinking. Come just past the next slide. Oh, have I got the thing? You got it. Sophie, you got the click. <laughs> now, this particular slide um, says, the trouble with normal people is they don't exist. And this is a this is in the collection called the National Disability Arts and Archive Collection, which I've been project manager of for the last year, um, which has been a most fantastic, amazing job because we've documented and digitised and worked with disabled artists and disabled depositors who have created work over the last 50 years. And a lot of that work has been hidden in people's lofts, garages, 
and other spaces. And I think what is amazing, we were able to launch the whole collection last Wednesday at the House of Lords. Unfortunately, Baroness Jane Campbell wasn't able to be there, but she has also been an ambassador to the project and she's helped a lot of this work um, get, really get onto the forefront and be digitized. So we have three and a half thousand artifacts from disabled artists. Some of those are very radical, very sort of protest driven. Some of them are very quirky, and some of them are just funny. They're really funny and amusing. I just moved it. Oh, no, it's me. I've got it. My sorry. Someone's trying to ring me. Oh, <laughs> um, so doing this work, it's been, it's been really incredible because I think one of the most amazing things was talking to disabled people about going out and campaigning and stopping the transport in London and, you know, handcuffing yourself to buses. Those, those disabled people really began to feel very powerful and have identities. At that particular time, when they used to create these protests, everyone had to connect via telephone. Um, there was no sort of social media, but people were still able to come together and block things like um, the, the telephone, the block telethon. Some of you may know about this. It's a bit like some of the other um, TV things that happen where you, know, you raise money for, for poor disabled people or disabled people that can't do things. And it was all about blocking that to try and say, look, at the moment, the way that society is set up and the way that disabled people's identities are set up is to, is to feel pity and is to not give us access to everything like jobs, education, art, theatres, transport. So a lot of this campaigning was really fantastic, really powerful for these disabled people. But some of the stories of these things behind the scenes, I think, are the most amazing stories. And one of them, talking to some of the people that I worked with, Barbara Lisicki is one of those people, was very powerful at this particular time doing the protests. Alan Holdsworth, Ian Stanton, Adam Reynolds, Tony Heaton, I think Maggie Woolley was one of those people. So there's all sorts of people that were involved in a lot of the protests. And one of the really interesting stories was that disabled people couldn't even be arrested because the transport wasn't accessible. They couldn't get wheelchair users <laughs> into the police vans. And I just thought, this is great. This is so interesting. You know, you can't be a criminal and be a disabled person. <laughs> Not only weren't the vans accessible, the courtrooms weren't accessible, and the cells weren't accessible. So it was a bit of an issue for the police officers arresting disabled people. And what used to happen is the police officers used to arrest disabled people. They felt so bad that they couldn't lock you up. They'd go out and buy fish and chips, Chinese, have a chat with a disabled person, <laughs> read their rights, you know, and, and all of that, and then say, well, you know, we'll, we'll let you off, you can go home. But it's just, I just, it was so fascinating, because no one tells you these stories until you actually start sitting down with disabled people and finding out all these things. And I think, you know, this is just one tiny element of the collection. We have an awful lot of things in there. But I just thought it I just thought it'd be really good just to share some of these stories. I just, oh, I've got it. <laughs> I've had a bad week. <laughs> um, one of the other things about the collection, and one of the other things about digital things, is as a disabled person, you can be excluded from things. So you can be excluded from theatre, you can be excluded from cultural interventions, you can be, you know, all sorts of things. Digital gives you access to being able to be part of these things. And I think what's been great is we've worked with different disabled artists. This was an event at Tate Exchange earlier this year where we were able to, in the collection, we have 47 campaign T-shirts about um, slogans that disabled people have put onto the T-shirts, gone out into the streets and had those protests. The slogans are fantastic. And we've worked with an artist called Poppy Nash who plays with words and slogans, but she's reinterpreted some of the campaign T-shirts She's modernised them. She's made them a bit more fun for younger generations. And I think this image is just showing you things like... And there's a really interesting thing for disabled people. When, when you're born, there's often always that issue around... That, and parents are told, you know, they're not going to live very long. And as a disabled person, you hear this continually at your clinic visits or your connection to the GP. You're told you can't have children. I mean, there's just so many things that you're told as a disabled person. So one of the campaigns that used to run is something called Not Dead Yet. So if you got to 50, it was like, yes, not dead yet, I'm still here. And, and Baroness Campbell will tell you that. It's really important, I think, that, that people stop doing that, really, and just live and have you know, fantastic experiences of lives um, and a part of the everyday. This is another interesting image, because this is an artist called Steve Cribbs, who sadly is not with us anymore. And Joe Cribbs, his brother, has given us his entire collection 
Steve Cribbs was incredibly way ahead of his time. Um, in the 70s, he became a disabled person. He, did, he was an illustrator and an artist, but he was not able to paint because he was deteriorating quite rapidly. So he started to use computers and digital technology really, really early on to really get his messages out about how annoyed he was with ignorance, um, misunderstanding, um, not having access to things. And he, at that time, he really talks about couldn't get on the bus, he couldn't go to the theatre. So these things are really significant and really important. And these, I think what's really important is language has changed and it's shifted. Disabled language is, I don't know, people use language in quite powerful, controlling ways to control disabled people. And you probably experience that and you probably see that. But I think it's really, un it's really interesting to understand things like the social model of disability, which some people might. And it's really trying to unpick the frameworks that are within, you know, that are in place within society. That it's not the disabled person that's the problem. It's the framework around you. So if all the framework around you is removed and you have full access, you're not a disabled person anymore. But that concept, that social construct, is still not really out there. People aren't talking about it and understanding how to in, you know, unpick barriers and unpick that sort of social, um, social segregation, if you like. And that's what's happened for a very long time. This particular image, it's like quite a few disabled artists play around with things like footprints. So they're playing around in this image. Steve Cribb has got the, um, um, the sort of marks of the wheelchair going across the floor and the footprints of a person. But it's that real play on, and Tony Heaton does this as well in a lot of his work. He's done a piece called Footprints in the Sand. And actually all you see are his, um, the crutches, those particular things. You don't see the footprints, you just see the crutches. And it's about different perspectives, different views, and it's sort of getting into the mindset of some of those opportunities and things that you know, happen to you as a disabled person. I feel, I think, in many ways, um, and I love all the work of Oliver Sacks, as a disabled person, you have a different perspective and a different viewpoint. And actually, that means it's really interesting because it's not the same as everyone else's. And I think that's really important to talk to young disabled people about that, that actually sometimes it's really interesting to not be the same. And I think it gives you a, a really, you know, a valuable way of observing the world and society and people around you and looking at where you fit in within all of that. Questions. I suppose um, I have to stand up to read these. Um, you may well be able to read them all, everyone here. Um, but questions you might want to start with, you know, ask yourself, who are disabled people? I know Sophie was talking a little bit about, um, you know, if, if you use technology or if as a disabled person you have a prosthetic leg, sometimes people don't agree with that. They don't want some of those things. But at the same time, it should be about individual choice. It should be about what works best for you. But also, I think you do need to have information about the social model of disability and about how you're placed within society if you're not even given that information, you can't make free choices. And I think that's the thing that's really important. And I think things like Twitter and social media and connecting to other people gives us a voice and gives us an opportunity to, to have those conversations, if you like. Um, the term includes neurodiversity, mental health, as well as physical and sensory impairments. The list is quite long. It doesn't just mean one set of people. I think it's really important to understand that. And one of the exercises I do as a trainer and I've done a lot of these working on 2012 on the cultural impact in the UK and spending four years working in Brazil up to 2016. And now we work in Japan. But one of the issues that we do, we talk about disability is. So we ask people what that is, disability is, and then get people to say what that is. And I think it's quite interesting when people start to actually write down and think it in, you know, in a lot of detail. What does that mean to you as an individual? Are you looking at this as a medical thing, as an impairment? Are you looking at it as blindness? Are you looking at it as a wheelchair user? Are you looking at it as the people that don't fit in? Or are you actually looking at the frameworks that the disabled person has been disempowered by not being able to get on the bus, by not being able to read information? You know, all those types of questions. Critical analysis, where are the gaps? What's missing? Who's missing? All of these things are so defined by sort of conventional... Um, conventional practice. Sometimes we just have to throw conventional practice out the window and say, let's start again, let's start engaging in a different way. And if we don't do that, we're going to miss people out. And we're also going to miss incredibly creative people out. And I, another thing I talk about is, you know, disabled people are incredibly creative because they've had to be. You have to find solutions to barriers. 
So you might find a more interesting walk to work. You may find a more interesting way to get to the theatre. You may find a more interesting way of actually watching the film that other people aren't having to do. But it sort of means that you're always having to think sort of twice as hard as everybody else. Um, I think the job is, and we need to work together. You know, disabled people shouldn't just be doing this on their own. It's about everyone un unpicking this. Um, and it's about the need to open this out not as an add-on, but at the heart of everything that you do. So I think it's really important that we start to look at it in a way that's fun, that's interesting, that's fascinating, not as a, it's another, oh, you know, another disabled person, oh dear. <laughs> I mean, I talk to museums and galleries quite a lot, and they go, God, it was such hard work having that group of blind people last week. And you just go, it's not about that, it's about the interventions and the new ways of communicating and using things that are actually quite fun that actually are really relevant to everyone. So if I talk about audio description, it's about using language in an interesting way, using descriptive language. And the research shows that if you use descriptive language when you share heritage objects to young people or to communities, they actually remember more about that object than if it's just a straightforward interpretation. And I think at that point, it's suddenly not about blind people, it's about us all being fantastic communicators, it's about enhancing collections, and it just shifts to a slightly other level. I think that's, you know, the way that we should look at all of these things. So am I talking too long? <laughs> um, and inclusion accessibility, it needs to be in your DNA. You know, it needs to be within all of us. Because as disabled people, we can't do it on our own. You know, otherwise we're a, a minority. You know, we need to do it as a majority, really. And I, you know, go out and do talks. And obviously Sophie does. Because we want to share that enthusiasm, that passion. It should be fun. It shouldn't be something you avoid. And I... You may not do that, but I know a lot of people that do avoid it, and a lot of people when I'm in a training situation sort of suddenly have to come to terms with meeting a disabled person. And I know um, some of the large charities do things like, you know, how to meet a disabled person, how to meet a blind person. Within the disability communities, the laughter and the fun and the craziness that goes on about things like that is quite, you know, it's, it's just great. And it's, it's a dialogue that disabled people have. It's probably not out there, but I think... Twitter is enabling us to get that out there, actually, and to challenge and question it. Next one, sorry. I mean, this is just, again, going back to the social model of disability, and I do use this quite a lot because it's a really useful framework. It makes you make sense of what's happening around you. It also makes sense of if you are trying to make sure you get rid of the barriers within an organisational setup and within an institution, <coughs> And we know institutions are a nightmare, you know, they have traditional things in place and trying to break those down can be quite difficult. But if you can start to be very, very clear about where the barriers are, you can really start to change and emphasise new ways of doing things. And you can give proper, firm reasons about why you do that and how you do that. And I think it's really worth looking at um, academics like Vic Finkelstein, again, who's not with us anymore, but... His work was fascinating around the social model of disability, and so is Mike Oliver's, and Mike's still alive, but it's, they're really interesting academics. And one of the, I think one of the key things about disability art and about deaf arts has been that academics, disabled academics and disabled artists suddenly came together, and that became a really powerful force. It's very, very unique in the UK. So when we go and talk in other countries and talk about all of this and the history, they're so excited and we start to say, you must map this history now, you must start to capture it, which I think is why, you know, coming back to the National Elizabeth Arts and Archive Collection, it's really important to hang on to all of this work and to hang on to all of these stories and to reinterpret those stories as well. Um, who is telling the stories? This is the thing about the archives and this is the thing about disability art. Um, how are disabled people contributing to the history, the content, we could look at examples and like the work undertaken with Jocelyn Dodd at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. That happened quite a long time ago now, but it was fantastic, really interesting work about looking at disabled representation within the collections in Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. And I think after that, I, I had a fantastic opportunity, particularly around 2012, uh, to work with Van Lee Burke. And I looked at audio describing the collection of Van, Van Lee Burke. Um, I don't know, is Craig still here? He may have gone. Has he gone? Um, but Craig gave me that opportunity to, Craig Ashley, to work with Van Lee Burke to look at how we could describe all of those photographs. 
So like people have talked about this morning, or David Bailey has talked about, you know, Van Lee's book, you know, it's amazing, it's incredible, and blind people want to access that work as well. And it's really worth remembering that most blind people have lost their sight, so they have a lot of memory about sight. So visual language is still incredibly important. This is Steve Cribb, this is just so you know who he actually is. Um, and it's one of those things that, in the collection, which will open, the actual physical collection will open at Bucks New University in December this year. You can go and see some of Steve Cribb's work. Sadly, a lot of it, the digital work, is not available. But we do have sort of paper copies of a lot of his work. And the stories and the insights and the poems and the things that he wrote about are really, really interesting from an architectural perspective, from an IT perspective, from an educational perspective, from a family perspective. He really did totally understand about exclusion. And again, Ian Stanton, a lot of his songs, they were fun. And it's about working with younger people now to look at, you know, Ian Drury, to look at all that work, to look at what are those political messages in those songs now? Who's delivering them? What are they? Who are those artists? The opportunities are fantastic now because programs like Sophie mentioned, Unlimited, young disabled artists or disabled artists can get opportunity to get funding. 10, 20, 30 years ago, it was all happening underground. Disabled people were supporting each other. Everything was a little bit rough around the edges because people didn't have the level of funding that they now get, and they didn't have access to mainstream. And in some ways, that was positive. That was good because it meant disabled people were making their own decisions, and it wasn't somebody else making the decision for you. I mean, these are just... Um, fortunately, we don't see some of these things in the newspaper anymore, but it's things like Lords Cripple Walks Again... You know, this is the way the media treats disabled people. They still do it, but their language is a little bit cleverer now. They sort of cover it up. But these messages are still sent out to people. And it's still that whole thing about, you know, let's collect money for the blind. Let's, you know, let's put programs on for disabled people because they're not going to get a job. We really need to unpick why they're not getting jobs, why they're not involved in all these things. And I think the digital age gives us a massive opportunity to, to really unpick this and to share these messages um, just another quick, these are just all things that are in the collection. Matt Fraser, quite a lot of people will know about Matt because he's very sort of out there, involved in all sorts of projects. Incredibly eloquent. There's an amazing film on the Museums Association website where Matt is talking to a, um, a disabled guy that's probably in his 50s now, but he's, they've captured film of him as a very young child. I don't know if has anybody seen that clip. I don't. It's really worth going to see it. It's very, very interesting. Um, and that's just to say thank you. That um, an NDACA is delivered by Shape. I have to say that. I have to say it's funded by HLF, Arts Council, and Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, but without them, we wouldn't be able to capture all these lives and give you these stories. I mean, there's lots of things I can tell you. Go to the website. I'm going to hand all these postcards around. So Lara's giving me permission. <laughs> Hi, I'm the last one, so you've only got between five and 25 minutes for, for, um, <laughs> to get there. Um, I am a, uh, the producer and programmer for Shout Festival of Queer Arts and Culture, and I'm also a theatre maker and creative producer working in the Midlands. Um, today, rather than talk about the ways that uh, queer people are represented or not represented, which is my sort of usual spiel. Um, I want to consider how queer people represent themselves, uh, particularly how this manifests itself in digital contexts and in thinking about how digital space supports, creates and sustains queer identity. Um, so the idea, and I'm saying idea here because I'm acknowledging that this is not the reality uh, behind the internet, is to be a levelling information and communication network capable of transcending physical and geographical barriers to connect people all over the world to information and to each other. Um, it allows for, facilitates and even thrives on the end user creating multiple iterations of themselves. And this is something that most of us do. Um, here are all my social media profiles. Uh, and yes, this is absolutely a shameless attempt to gain more followers, so <laughs> feel free to do so. Um, but you can see there's sort of different iterations of myself. Most of these pictures taken before I shaved all my hair off as well. So, um, 
So particularly on social media, this is something that a lot of us do. It's these multiple representations of identity, though, that offer so much potential to queer people, and particularly to young queer people at the early stages of developing a relationship with their sexuality or with their gender identity. Um, one of the complications of queer identity is the necessity to be out. Um, queerness is not always visibly marked. If and when queer people are included in images or media, um, it's not always immediately apparent from looking. Um, and as such, our visibility is temporal and therefore continually at risk. Uh, much of our early experiences are shaped by feelings of isolation, um, of alienation and disconnection from a normative, normative society. Um, and from this often stems an inherent fear of rejection, a sense of inadequacy and or shame. Uh, whilst there are circumstances in which this invisibility might afford queer people a certain degree of privilege over, say, other marginalised communities, uh, characteristics even, um, in that we're able to maintain our safety or access to something by concealing ourselves and passing, um, although gender non-conforming people do not have this option, um, this easily allows us to remain invisible. Uh, we're consistently forced into vulnerable positions where we must repeatedly make ourselves out, where we actively put ourselves at risk of danger from negative or sometimes violent reactions if we're deemed to have somehow deceived someone of our identity. Uh, and this can make navigating physical environments very difficult and often disorientating for queer people. Um, for example, I guess the opposite of, of what Ellie's experience was. As I become more femme, I uh, lose male privilege. Um, and for example, how that manifests in me, I will often remove my earrings, which are very subtle today, but not always. Uh, if I'm walking somewhere alone, um, I will lower the pitch of my voice, or I won't speak in public spaces, or particularly in confined spaces like taxis, um, which is all in an attempt to appear more straight as a way of avoiding conflict or avoiding violence. Um, and these acts of external and self-policing contribute to a wider epidemic in queer communities of internalised homophobia and or transphobia. Um, it's these feelings of isolation and regulation that position the internet and particularly social media platforms as such essential tools and often lifelines to queer people. Um, our identities, as I've demonstrated, are in some ways performative. We demonstrate our queerness either through choice in the way that we present, what we say, what we wear, or by default, because our bodies, our identities, our voices, gestures, our partners do not conform to rigid expectations of a cis heteropatriarchy. Um, digital spaces are a testing ground for queer identities. For many, they're often the first space where queer iteration of ourselves exists. Um, the same fear that, that makes me police myself also took my formative explorations of queerness into a kind of digital realm, uh, back in the days of Gaydar um, and pre-Facebook. Pre um, many young people now choose to come out to Facebook or to YouTube before... Um, I've lost my place. So just ruminate on that for a bit. Um, before they can ever speak this in a non-digital space. Um, often for trans people, social media can often be the first place that they are comfortable or able to live as themselves, identified with their correct gender identity and their chosen name. Um, and for some, digital encounters will be the first time that we ever connect with or see other queer people in any kind of space or representation. So our relationships to digital spaces are often transformative. They're transgressive spaces where we can experiment and learn and share and connect, where we have access to information that otherwise we may not. Digital technologies have altered the way that we connect, and because of that, how we think of ourselves and our identities. Rather than creating digital identities for ourselves, our digital experience helps us to create or at least understand our own queer identities. Um, so why is this important to the arts and cultural sector? Uh, firstly, it's a background for understanding why positive representation for queer communities, and particularly representation from within our communities, and I cannot stress that enough, uh, is so important, and the role that we can all play in um, facilitating that. Um, secondly, it's about finding spaces that audiences or potential audiences can connect with you, uh, and about understanding the barriers to access for queer people to venues, to work, um, Often digital spaces become places where we can introduce new and alternative discourses into public spaces. 
Um, Helga mentioned right at the beginning that I recently challenged the RSC, and actually all ACE-funded organisations, so all of you in the room who represent organisations are not exempted from this. Yeah. I know who you are. I know, well, and the ones of you who are not in the room, especially you. Um, and Yeah, absolutely. Uh, around venues openly using their... Um, Welcome, SGs, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the RSC, uh, and how actually, as, as we're required to report on uh, non-binary identities as well, that that is not a particularly welcoming or inclusive message. And I mean this in the most literal sense. That is the least you can be doing to make your venue accessible. <laughs> the least. It costs nothing to change. If your venue doesn't do that, already, or the organisation that you represent, go back and change that, because uh, I'll be coming for you on social media um, <laughs> about that. And I think, I wasn't going to say this, but I, I will, that actually that it's important to recognise that that can be uh, often the only space where we can challenge those kind of um, issues. And again, I hope that that reflects back upwards. But, uh, for example, in that space, you know, I've paid £50 for a ticket to be there. I don't necessarily feel... Uh, that I am comfortable or able, or I'm trying to avoid a situation that, that puts myself in, in a vulnerable position by challenging that face-to-face -face in that space. Um, and I think the internet has become a really important tool for that, but also in raising awareness, and usually because you can get someone who's actually gonna respond to you and not just someone who's on the box office who probably doesn't know uh, what non-binary is. Um, and that is another issue. <laughs> but I'm not here to list all of the issues, uh, honestly. Um, so these online spaces are therefore counter-public spaces um, that we can learn from our audiences. We can engage with them. And from that, we can make venues more accessible. We can program more effectively. And we can develop more meaningful relationships. Finally, and I think what's the most important of all of these is it demonstrates a need for a different kind of creative engagement. Um, for many queer people, the transition from digital space to physical space is significantly more complex and dangerous than it is for our non-queer counterparts. Um, sometimes that's impossible, particularly for people who come from traditionally conservative backgrounds or from some faith-based communities. Rejection, shunning, uh, conversion therapy. Conversion therapy, there was a so-called before that, so you'll, you'll have to forgive my inverted commas there. Um, hate crime, domestic violence, forced heterosexual marriage uh, are very prevalent and very much exist. Those things happen right now in this city. Uh, we experience that and we see that on a daily basis and it is invisible for, for the reasons I've outlined. Um, but those are real issues that affect people and they're real barriers that legitimately prevent engagement with any kind of queer relevant work. And that's not just art, um, that's community work. Sometimes that's access to healthcare. Uh, they might even be reporting something to the police or seeking legal support in a space that might out you and therefore put you in actual danger uh, for people who need it the most. Um, and it's these communities who are invisible, even within an invisible community, who rely on digital content, on the relative protective anonymity of digital counterpublics, um, as, a result for, as a resource sorry, for survival when physically entering a queer space might identify them as such and put their safety at risk. And this doesn't even begin to go into the intersections of queerness and disability and access around that. Um, so I'm kind of issuing a call, I guess, for uh, digital creation and resource for open and accessible queer digital content and the tools to create that content uh, that can be freely accessed anywhere, anytime, by anyone, and specifically by those who cannot access it anywhere else. That's all I have to say. I think that's a really, really good way to end it, isn't it, on that call, and we probably need to get that projected somewhere as well. Um, are there any burning questions from anybody? Yeah. Oh, do you want to... Oh. Thank you very much. Um, a question for Adam Carver. Um, how do we prevent uh, marginalisation within an already marginalised community? Um, for example, the discrimination that bisexuals get. Um, and it's almost a double discrimination from heterosexuals as well as homosexuals. Um, what are pragmatic ways to really combat that? I think that's a really, really tough question. Um, I think that I'm going to differentiate here, I guess, between queer culture and LGBT culture. Um, that I think 
traditionally, LGBT culture and particularly gay culture has essentially just been a replicant of patriarchy, and we adopt the same processes just with a step, like one one element removed. Like misogyny is very prevalent in in the LGBT community. Racism is very prevalent in LGBT community, and I think that's a problem. And I think some of that comes down from the fact that we have we exist in a a, a world that is is about one thing or the other. It's very binarist in its approach, and so. Uh, bisexuality, pansexuality is a, a real threat to those kind of, of identities and, and the sort of fluidity of that. I think that how we approach that is primarily, well, in part through positive representation and through visible representation. Uh, I think it's about people who are in whatever position of privilege that might be, So, and I, I would include gay men in that uh, bracket as well amplifying the voices and needs of um, of other community marginalized voices within our own communities um, I'm reticent to call us one community because I, I don't believe that to be the case um, certainly I think that that there is an attitude uh, amongst certain sects of the community that we were in a post liberation space and I think this kind of chimes with what what you were saying about uh, the sense that, that these narratives around disability are sort of in the past, but actually they're still very prevalent. And this idea that we've somehow achieved equality because we got same-sex marriage, which didn't necessarily want. Um, it, and that that's the end of that journey is a really prevalent notion, not just amongst um, straight society, but also amongst gay society. Um, and I think we, we have an active duty to learn more about and, and to understand more about the, the issues that people from uh, marginalised perspectives within our community uh, face and to, to better advocate and be better allies for them. That's a very like broad answer I appreciate, but I think it is about, firstly, about representation, about making sure that those perspectives are heard and, and understanding that there is a need for those voices to be heard. And in terms of investment, investing, you know, if the work isn't there, making the work, and that's certainly like one of the commitments that we've made as a festival, is that there are limited amounts of, of commissioning money are, are, will be spent on developing work for the platform's voices from people who we're not already hearing from. And I think that's part of it, is that as a sector, we need to be looking at how we support teasing out and, and platforming, giving equal precedence to those voices. Oh, Chris. I've sat down now because my legs are going to seize up after something a while day. Um, another one for Adam. Sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot again. Um, it, you talked about sort of creating those, those platforms and sort of the sp safe spaces online. In your, in your head, what would one of those platforms look like? What would it be? A simp uh, yeah, what would it be? <laughs> Ideally, they'd be as pluralist as they possibly can be so that they can be accessed in as many different ways or places as possible. Um, but Shout is, is, is about, on the, at the beginning of, of creating a, a sort of digital portal that will um, we'll build supplementary work around a lot of our existing work, but will also, over time, commission digital work that will be specifically held there, that will be accessible year-round through... Um, I think the thing is, it has to be open source, it has to be freely accessible to everyone. Um, and and that, the plan for that is to, to launch something quite big with that in, in November, and once we've got that properly shaped, I'll, I'll know. <laughs> but I, it's a test. I don't think we know what the answers to those no, questions are yet. Yeah. Because, yeah, I completely support that, that, that that's something that's really needed, but there's also, it's also a generational problem. So I've just finished this project called Queer, Queer Encounters, which is open in King's Cross, and it's been, I've been gathering people's stories. Um, from King's Cross from the 80s, 90s and noughties and a lot of people there talk about the internet and how they, how actually a safe space is offline that they don't because actually sometimes people are married and they have a different life and then they have their kind of Tuesday nights in this bar or whatever or they have their lover or whatever and online they're terrified of the fact that now everything's photographed and actually anonymity today is really, really hard. So what do you do about the people that do not, because there are obviously people who do want to be out and do want to be themselves the whole time. There are also people that for various reasons, that to do with privilege, to do with all sorts of different reasons, a lot of what we've been talking about today, who are not able and do not want that. And that's actually the online thing of everything being shared. And actually, I, prob I would have said some more stuff also had, had we not been live streaming. 
because I would have spoken to the room here and said some more stuff that I don't feel I can say because I don't know who's watching outside this room. So I think that's a really important thing for the whole online offline thing. On the one hand, accessibility, everybody gets to do it. But on the other hand, don't lose the, the permission to be anonymous or to be a small group of people you can look in the eye and you can actually see who's there. Because I think different discussions happen face to face than they do online. And there are some discussions that are much, more, much easier to have online that you can't have face to face and also vice versa. So I think that's a super important thing that as we're developing these platforms that they exist. And it's actually the internet is partly why so many gay bars across the world have closed. And gay bars are not just about like Grindr, uh, does not replace a gay bar. Grinder is about hooking up with someone. A gay bar is about walking into a space and going, I can just be myself now for half an hour. And when those spaces have gone, particularly from smaller, space, smaller cities and smaller towns, the last gay bars are all closing. And where do those people go for that drink, for that, for that moment of just being able to sit there and just be read for who they are from the moment they walk in? So. It's absolutely not about replacing one with the other. No, exactly. It's about both, like keeping both. I think there is that lack of safe space. I mean, you, you look at, you know, uh, 10 years ago when you, you know, you talk about gaydar and, and things like that, but we've almost regressed because those safe spaces, those, those websites, those platforms that were all under username and, and lock and key and stuff, there are very few of those now. It's a lot more open in, in you know, the digital age. And those spaces that, online as well, they just don't really exist anymore and their people are moving towards more open platforms like Grindr which any uh, anybody could create a, uh, a profile on and then throw abuse at any, anybody you know it's because it's so open and it can be quite dangerous we've kind of by making things more public it's also become mm. quite dangerous as well and it's, it's just yeah scary <laughs> Okay, I think there are so many more questions that we wanted to get into, and I wanted to really get into the audience reaction as well, and collaboration, um, and so many more things, and in the Midlands context as well. But what we'll do, hopefully, is just carry on the conversation under the hashtag HCIdentity um, on Twitter or any social network. Um, if you follow that, I'm sure there, there's things online already, and I'm sure we, we can pick up some of those conversations. Um, I'm sure we're trending on Grinder as well as Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. <laughs> um, but can I just say thank you again to probably the best panel of the day, obviously. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.